All right. Thank you for coming. Welcome to the talk on 12 ways to make code suck less. My name is Venkat Subramaniam. We're going to talk about a few ways in which we can improve the code quality. But before we talk about it, I want to say that there are maybe four kinds of people in the world. I would say the first kind of people are the what kind of people. They want to know what you're doing. Then there are the when kind of people. When will you get done? And then the third type is how. How do you really do this? Uh, I belong to the fourth category, which is the why kind of people. Why, why are you doing this? Uh, because if I cannot convince myself to do something, maybe I wouldn't really do it. So I'm going to start with the question, why should we really care about code quality? And I'm going to say the number one reason I want to care about code quality is because we cannot be agile if our code sucks. As simple as that. You are, you're sitting in a meeting, and they're talking about having to make a change to the XYZ module, and you realize that the last time you touched the XYZ module, you couldn't go home for the weekend, you're going to convince them you don't want to make this change. So it's out of question. You cannot sustain agility if the quality of code is really bad. But then I started thinking there is maybe more reasons why we should really care about code quality, and I think I came up with one more reason. And that is, code is how we tell our colleagues how we feel about them. Do we love them, or do we hate them all? So this is one of the ways we can communicate to the rest of the team that we actually love them, and we like to work with them, and we want them to continue to improve the code we create. So it's one of the things to really look at the code quality. But of course, the question is, we talked about why we want to improve the code quality. The next question, of course, is, what is really code quality? Well, it turns out the first law of programming says that lowering quality develop, uh, um, um, lengthens the development time. So if you want to really go slower, you want to create poor quality code, and that will naturally slow us down. So we want to really create better quality code because it actually helps us to improve the speed. Well, that brings up the question then, if we want to really improve the quality, what is really quality? And uh, I'm, I'm sure we all have different definitions of what a good quality code is. I would take any definition than the one I got from a coworker once, and his definition was, this code is really good because I wrote it. I don't think that's a really good definition. <laughs> so we want to really have a better definition of what quality is, and here's my definition of what good quality code is. I'm going to say the quality of code is inversely proportional to the amount of time and effort it takes to understand it. If a code is of really good quality, you spend less time understanding it. If a code is of really poor quality, you take more time to understand it. As I do code reviews, I always tell my developers, you don't want me to spend more time on your code. That's not a good sign. You want me to come in and understand it and leave really quickly. You want the code to be really transparent. So what we will talk about here is 12 ways we can improve the code quality. Honestly, a lot of these are already familiar to you, but I'm hoping that you'll pick up a few little tips and pointers along the way. And if at all, nothing else, it will motivate you to go back and improve the quality of code for your own teams. So the first thing I want to talk about is schedule time to lower the technical debt. Now, we all talk about technical debt quite often. The technical debt was coined by Ward Cunningham, and he worked in the financial industry and realized that how the financial industry has financial debt, debt, we, uh, debt we have also have a, a debt in the terms of the technical nature as well. So when it comes to this, you don't have to do much, unfortunately, to really create technical debt. That little library or the framework that you used six months ago has really gone through three more versions and have even had a chance to really uh, update it, and that turns into a technical debt. That schema has not been kept up over time, and you really need to go back and fix it. That's a technical debt. But it's important to be careful what we call as technical debt. Writing code of poor quality intentionally is not a technical debt. It's an act of sabotage. So we have to be really careful giving names to these things. Well, when it comes to technical debt, we have to really take attention to this. And one of the things I always tell teams is not if they have technical debt, because we all do. But when I walk into a company, in, on the wall, I want to see a list of technical debt listed from the most difficult one and troublesome one to the least troublesome one. So I want a prioritized list of technical debt on the wall. Now, why do I insist on having this on the wall? Part of the reason for that is we often talk about technical debt during the retrospection, but I want that to be on top of our mind every single day. On that Wednesday afternoon as we are writing code, 
we can look up on the wall and say, what is my effort going to do? Is it going to end up on that wall next week? Or am I going to really write better quality code? So I want to really see that on the wall quite a bit. So we want to schedule time towards it. So on projects, normally, we allocate time for development. We also have time for planning and various other activities like meetings. We also have time for vacation and sickness. Uh, sometimes companies don't give enough time for vacation. We take more sickness. It all kind of works out in the end. But the point really is that we schedule time for all of these in, 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 in our projects, but we also have to specifically schedule time for technical debt as well. And once we do, we can say, in the next sprint, maybe she will spend 10% of her time on the technical debt one, and he will spend maybe 10% uh, of his time on the technical debt, and then sh uh, so will he spend time on uh, maybe another technical debt, and we can divide the time between uh, different developers and have that addressed over time. Well, we talked about scheduling time to pay technical debt. Next, I want to talk about favoring high cohesion. So what is cohesion? Cohesion is where a piece of code is narrow, focused, and does one thing and one thing really well. And that's what a cohesive code really is. And cohesion is extremely important for lowering the cost of maintaining code because it really has a very direct impact on the frequency of change for the code itself. A code that is more cohesive changes less frequently. A code that is less cohesive changes more frequently. And as a result, it's more expensive to make the change to it as well. So we want to really lower the, uh, increase the cohesion. But how do we measure cohesion? One way to do that is to look for the cyclomatic complexity. It reminds me of an experience. I was on a project, uh, consulting on a project, and when I was mentioning this, one of the developers on the team asked me to come over to his machine. And these, uh, this particular project, they've been writing code, this one particular application has been writing code for 30 years. And, and it's nerve-wracking to walk into companies like that because some of the developers on the project would come and tell me they wrote the very first line of code on the project. Can you imagine sitting next to somebody who wrote the first line of code 30 years ago, and they are still on the project? trying to figure out if they retire first or die first. And this is something that is just absolutely phenomenal. And, and then this developer uh, has this version control with 30 years of code in it. Can you imagine one version control with 30 years of code in it? And he grabs the timeline, drops it 15 years ago, and I saw this function. It was the day this function was born. I can see its entire naked body, so cute, little name, only two parameters to it. I can see its entire function in front of me. As I was admiring this function the day it was born, he points me to the cyclomatic complexity, a value of five for this function, when 10 is considered to be really high. And as he was admiring this, he grabs the timeline and moves it to the current day. And in front of me, I saw this beautiful little function turn into a monster. Don't even ask me how many parameters it had now. I can't see its tail anymore. And as I was looking at it, he points to the cyclomatic complexity, a value of 864. And then he said, that's what we do to code in this company. Well, if we don't refactor the code continuously, it can become a disaster to maintain. So it's our responsibility to really take time to do this. The next thing I want to emphasize here is to favor a loose coupling. Well, we often talk about coupling. Uh, uh, the, the worst keyword, in my opinion, in Java, hands down, is a three-letter word. It's called new, because new means tight coupling, isn't it? So we often use interfaces to decouple, but I want to go a step further. It's not adequate for me. So we often ask for decoupling because it becomes really hard to extend with tight coupling. It becomes hard to test the code as well. So we want to really decouple it. But in addition to decoupling, I want to remove coupling as much as possible instead of decoupling. And I don't think we do this enough on projects. So for example, let's say we have a middle class over here, which depends on the class on the right side, and the class on the left is talking to the one on the middle. Now, this one on the right side is extremely non-deterministic. In order for us to test the code in the middle, we will have to use a lot of mocks and stub. 
And I'm going to say that when it comes to automated testing, if a team is using a lot of stubs and marks, that's a sign of poor design. We don't want to use too many marks and stubs. That's something we need to be very careful about. Well, in this case, of course, we have to use a lot of mark and stub because of this dependency. We can quickly realize, maybe I can rework this a little bit. So I'm going to move this dependency a little bit. So rather than having the dependency here, I'm going to move it up here. So this particular code in the middle now can receive the data from this particular piece of code. So we don't have to really be passing the uh, data from this call, but instead can be fetched and passed to it. What's the benefit of this? Well, it becomes almost trivial to automate the test for this particular code now because we don't need to write as many automated, uh, uh, as many stubs and marks at this point to write automated tests. So that becomes a lot easier. But of course, the question is, did we just shift the burden? Do we have to do a lot more mocking over here? And the answer is not really, because this interaction over here is a lot more fine-grained, whereas this interaction is a lot more coarse-grained often. So by rearranging dependencies, we can actually lower that burden quite a bit. So in addition to really uh, uh, lowering, uh, uh, loosening the coupling, we should uh, find ways to either remove coupling or at least move it as much as we can, and I don't think we are doing that enough in design, but I want to encourage people to uh, think a little bit more about how we can actually do this. Well, the next thing I want to talk about here is programming with intention. I think we do this quite often, where we are just desperately trying to get a piece of code to work. The other day, I was working with a colleague of mine. I was new to the project. I don't know much about it. But I was refactoring the code, and we had an index variable. So I took the index variable, accessed the object, and as soon as I did it, the test immediately failed. And I looked at my colleague and said, look, the test is failing. What should I do? And immediately he had a really wonderful suggestion. He said, try index plus one, he said. So I put index plus one, and I saved the code, and the test immediately failed. I didn't even talk at this point. I just shrugged. And he, without missing a beat, he said, try index minus one. I'm like, are you serious now? And then he said, maybe we should understand what the code is doing. What a great idea. So the point really is, these are called programming with desperation. We try to throw things together and see if it's working. And we should really program with intention. I hope that everyone in this room will agree to the sentiment. I came across this poor developer who expressed this view. Uh, he said, uh, when I wrote this code, only God and I understood what I was doing. Now God only knows. <laughs> so this is so true, isn't it? So we come across code like this all the time on our project. And you're sitting and staring at this code, and you're like, why this code is there? And it's really, really hard to understand what this code is doing. So we should really take the time to write code that actually is uh, pretty intentional, and it can be really easy to understand why we, this code even exists. That is absolutely critical. Well, this is one of the reasons I'm a huge fan of what is called the Four Rules of Simple Design by Ken Beck. And Ken Beck really nails it. He says there are four rules for simple design. The first rule he talks about is, is called passes all the test. There is an implicit assumption there that we actually have tests for the code to pass, but to pass all the tests is his first rule. The second one is the code reveals intention. The third one is there should be no duplication in code. And the last one is one of my favorites, minimalism, parsimony, or the fewest elements. So he says that when you are designing code, design it with these four simple rules, uh, passes all the tests and reveals intention. And if you have ever a confusion between two rules, take the one on the top as a, a priority than the one in the bottom. And of course, no duplication. And finally, a few as elements. And we want to be really able to write code with intention. This is one of the reasons I like to write tests before writing the code, because I can think a little bit about what the code should do before I try to jump into implement the code itself. Well, the next thing I want to talk about is to avoid primitive obsession. We see this a lot on projects. The other day I was doing a code review, and, and honestly, I, I was not sure why I was unhappy with this code. It was only 30 lines of code. The test was passing with the test that we had in place, but something really bothered me. After looking at it for a long time, finally I figured out why I was unhappy. The reason is that this 30 lines of code was manipulating a string. And I asked myself, if this code is manipulating the string, I'm sure that this is probably done already. And I did a little search. And to my surprise, I found the code that does that in the JDK already. 
And the developer had written 30 lines of code to do it with one difference, though. This 30 lines of code had two bugs. The JDK didn't have it. And, and once I realized it, what I did was I, re I commented out the code, and I just called the JDK method, saved the files, and the test automatically passed again. An hour went by. The developer came along, looked at the fact that I had commented out all the code, and quietly removed the code and walked away. I think it's a really nice way to communicate, right? To remove the code that's not needed. Nowadays, I have a very different recommendation for developers. I ask them to ask one question. When you sit down to write a piece of code, ask this very important question, are you the chosen one? If you are the chosen one, you should write this code. If it's very domain specific, the chances are you are the chosen one. If it's a very general purpose code, I'm, 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 I'm sorry with all respect, somebody else was chosen a long time ago and they did a better job than what I and you can do. So it's important for us to really let that go. So we want to really focus on high level of abstraction. I'm going to say imperative code is packed with accidental complexity and we deal with this all the time in our programming. Let's take a little example and play with it just to enter in this thought and how that feels. So here is a piece of code. It tells me whether a number is prime or not. And I have a very simple problem at my hand. I've got some random value n and a random value k, and I want to compute the following. I want to find the total of the square root of the first k prime numbers that start with n. So help me out here. How would I do this? I'm going to say double result is equal to 0. That's a really good start. I'm going to return the result when I am done with it. And within this, I'm going to say int index is equal to n. And I'm going to say count is equal to 0. So what did I do so far? Absolutely nothing useful. These are called garbage variables. Let's be honest about it. When you're writing code, you never call them result and index and count. You call them as t or f because you're conveying your intention. You're saying you don't deserve to live. And that's how we feel about code, isn't it? But you give a name painstakingly and say, that's the code I'm going to write. What is the next thing you do? Then you say here, a while count is less than k, then you come to a grinding halt, and you ask this nerve-wracking question, is it less than or less than or equal to? <laughs> do you ever ask this question? every single time. The only purpose of the symbol is to really make us feel stupid. Because every time you write this code, you got to stop and ask the question, huh, is it less than or less than or equal to? Then what do you do? Then you say, if e is prime of the value index, then I'm going to say result plus equal to math dot square root of index. So help me out here. Is this code correct? Come on, we're programmers here. What do you think? No, what is wrong? What's missing? Oh, I have to increment. I heard that. Increment count. Is it good now? No. Increment the index. Fine. Increment the index. Is it correct now? No. I've got to do it outside. Thank you. I did it outside. Is it correct now? You're like, no, 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 no. Do this in... How do you feel about this? <laughs> right? <laughs> now I'm going to ask you the question, is the code correct now? Did you notice you went from, no, it's not right, to, wait, wait, I'm still thinking. I'll tell you one thing I've learned in my decades of experience as programmer. Programmers are the smartest people on earth. Because when you show code like that and ask them, uh, code like this and ask them, is it correct? They are very smart. They will answer you, it looks good. Because they never will tell you it's correct. And so I'm going to go ahead and run this code and see what it does. It gave us a result. You could ask me the question, is the result correct? I'm going to tell you, it looks good. So we have this code working. But I've come to a realization. This code here is a primary example of a very simple problem, but a very complicated solution. This is called accidental complexity. I have a theory about this, by the way. And the theory is it's code like this that prematurely turns programmers into managers. Because they said, I'm done with this. I'm not going to do this anymore. And we find the nearest exit. Now, it actually takes a lot more effort. The people in this room, there's a name for every one of us. You are called the survivor. Because the, I, I know this is hard for a lot of us because we've been doing this for a while. But take a minute to think about this for a minute. Can you remember the very, very, very first day you ever wrote your first code? 
How was it? You wrote your code and you said, yes, I'm a programmer. And the comp a person next to you said, did you compile it? And you're like, what in the world is that? And you compiled it, right? And what did the compiler do? It spat on your face. And you were in a shock and you said, oh my gosh, what is this? And you wiped your sp spitting and then you fixed the compilation error and you got moving. What happened the second day? The compiler spat on you more. What happened the third day? It did it again. And 10 years later, it still does it to you. And you just don't care because you said, I am here for the long term, right? It actually takes that kind of courage to survive this, and that's what you're going to do. So let's talk about how we could po possibly do this a little bit better. So let's try this one more time in a functional style of programming. I am going to go ahead and start with this example one more time. Return over here, stream.iterate. And where am I starting? With the index given, given an element, element plus one. Stop right there. What are we doing? This is called an infinite stream. What does the infinite stream do? Starts with index, index plus one, index plus two, index plus three, index plus four. It keeps on going. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh my goodness, if this is an infinite stream, where would you store it? On the cloud, of course. But the point really is that you're going to take this one and say filter, and then you're going to say sample, and you're going to say is prime. And this gives you all the prime numbers starting with the given index. Then you say map to double. And then what are you going to say here? I'm going to say math square root. And you're asking for all the values that are square root of all the prime numbers. Then you say limit k. You may ask the question, is it k minus 1? Is it k? It's k, damn it, keep moving. And then you can simply say uh, sum, and you can return the value out of it. And as you can see in this particular case, it becomes incredibly easy to write this code, and it gives you the same exact response as the other one. But notice this code becomes a lot more easier to understand because the code begins to flow like the problem statement. Given all the values starting with n, give me all the prime numbers starting with n, give me the square root of those numbers, but give me only k of them and total it. And so what just happened? The code becomes a lot more easier to understand. In fact, I have a little theory about it too. I'm going to say a good code should be like a story, not like a puzzle. So when I look at the code, it's absolutely obvious what the code is doing. It's not a puzzle. But a lot of times, we create puzzles for other poor programmers. And sometimes they find your puzzle in a few hours, sometimes in a few days. Sometimes it may even go for a few months. And on that Wednesday afternoon, you're coding in your cubicle, and you hear this shriek from the other cubicle. And then you're like, they got it, right? <laughs> so the point really is, if you place puzzles like this, guess what? They're going to return the favor to you. In the meantime, we got production code to release. So I want the code to read like a story, not like a puzzle. That is something that I would say is a quality of really a good code. Well, the reason I really like functional style of programming is, to me, functional programming is declarative style of programming. Imperative style is where you tell what to do, but you also spend the time saying how to do it. In the case of declarative style of programming, you tell about what to do and don't spend effort telling how to do it because the underlying libraries can figure out how to do it. And so functional style is declarative plus the use of higher order functions. So the real reason why functional style is really exciting is the declarative aspect of functional style of programming. And that's what is one of the most charming features of this particular style of programming. It removes accidental complexity from the code. Well, the next thing I want to mention here is to prefer clear code instead of clever code. Uh, how many of us have never written clever code? Raise your hand if you've never written clever code, right? Exactly. Every one of us has done that. But I'll tell you why do we write clever code. I'll tell you why we do. Because it feels really good. And when you write your clever code, you have, you, you, nobody understands it. 
you can go home and show to mom and say, look, mom, I wrote this, and nobody understood this. And mom says, I know you'll be successful one day in your life, right? So this is so absolutely phenomenal. We feel good about it. And in fact, I always tell companies, when you hire interns, don't just hire interns and then send them back. Go with them to campus and listen to what they say. When they go back to campus, they say, the company I interned with in the summer, those people are geniuses. I understood nothing of what they do, right? So this is a sign that we actually like to write clever code. Well, in my own experience, I was working on a project when a client said they want to enhance a feature. I looked at this request and I said to myself, oh, this will take 10 minutes, but that is beneath me. I'm not gonna solve this problem. I'm gonna solve the mother of all problems. I'm gonna solve the meta problem. I spent an hour doing it. When I finished it, I had an out of body experience. Venkat got up and hugged me and said, you are awesome. So it felt really good to solve this bigger problem than the smaller problem they gave me. A few weeks went by, I was on the mailing list, and I heard them say something absolutely disastrous has happened in production. I looked at it, immediately responded saying, I'm on it, I'll fix it. And they said, oh, we know you'll fix it because you're really that good. And I said, no, 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 I'm gonna fix it not because I'm good, I'm gonna fix it because I'm the one who caused it. Well, that wonderful cleverness backfired totally and destroyed a lot of things in production. So what did I do? I rolled back my change and put the 10 minutes of change I had in mind and never heard from them after that regarding this. Nowadays, I've learned my lesson really the hard way. When I write a piece of code, my little brain tells me, oh, Venkat, that's clever. I immediately delete the code and I start over. I don't want clever code, I want clear code. So when it comes to this, a beautiful statement here, programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. So this is so true because we spend time writing code once, but we rewrite code and read code almost a million times over, so we should really work towards creating code that's actually readable. Here's another theory that I have, and I think I'm more and more convinced about this theory these days, and that is 10% of the time, we write ugly code for performance reason. The other 90% of the time, we write ugly code just to be consistent <laughs> with the other pieces of code. And the other day, a programmer came to me and asked the question, oh, he was like so angry. He said, I just came from this meeting. This developer had written such a bad Python code. And then he said, and they wrote this code because they want to have better performance. What do you think he said? I said, I won't answer it, but let me ask you this question. Is the performance really good? He said, no, that's the problem. So I have this other theory. Those who sacrifice quality to get performance may actually end up getting neither, and this is so true true that the code is so broken, we can't really fix it, and that becomes really hard to fix it over time and improve the performance as well. So we should really strive to uh, make the code easier to understand and not get very clever and start uh, you know, doing things that are not really obvious for the reader of the code. A beautiful quote by Tony Hur, he says there are two ways of constructing a software design. One is to make it so simple that there are obviously no deficiencies, and the other is to make it so complicated there are no obvious deficiencies. So this is something we should be very careful about because sometimes we don't even know what possibly is broken in a piece of code, and so we have to be really careful about this also. So we should really write a, a code that is clear rather than writing code that is clever as much as we can. Well, the next thing I'm gonna say here quickly is to apply what is called the Zinsers principle on writing. Now, uh, this is something that I uh, cannot really emphasize enough. This is a non-technical book written about 30 years ago by Mr. Uh, uh, William Zinsser. Uh, Mr. Zinsser passed away a few years ago, but he left something phenomenal for the world. And this is a book on writing good English. It is not a programming book. It's not a computer-related book. He talks about how to write better nonfiction. But this is a book I almost came accidentally. I started speaking English when I was 17 years old. I could not put together a sentence in English, so it was really a, a struggle for me, and English is not something I can just get to so easily. And, and then, of course, as years went by, I started really forcing myself to speak English more and more, but then I started writing, uh, you know, got excited about writing book. 
And the very first book I wrote, the people who edited the book, those days they were not called as editors, they were called as victims. And they had to read my English. And one of those editors came to me and said, is this your last book? I said, no, this is my first book. And they said, we're in trouble now. And so they said, do us a favor, before you would write another book, read this book. So this book actually was given to me by one of the editors and they said, read it. And ever since I read it, I found it extremely valuable that I started in turn gifting this book for a lot of people, especially children. And I find this to be one of the most important books I've ever read. And this book talks about how to write better English. There are so many things in the book, but he talks about four principles for writing good English. And as I was reading this, I was almost screaming out saying, my gosh, this is not about writing English. This is about writing code. And I consider these principles as the first principles for refactoring code as well. The very first thing he talks about is simplicity. He says when you write English, your English has to be simple. Isn't that what we say about code as well all the time? Then he says clarity. If what you're writing is not clear, nobody is going to read your writing. Same thing with code as well. Why is code not clear? The reason the code is not clear is there is a lack of flow in the code. The programmer is doing stuff here and suddenly doing something over here, and we are not able to follow through the logic in the code, and that makes really uh, unclear. Same thing in writing English as well. Uh, brevity is where we want the, uh, uh, the sentences to be short, the paragraphs to be short, chapters to be short. Well, in the case of code, we want the code to be uh, fewer lines of code rather than being large functions. So that is something we should definitely try to do. And the last thing he mentioned here is the one I had the most difficulty with. I saw this word humanity, and I said to myself, gosh, that's something we don't have to worry about. We write code for the computers, isn't it? But the, but the problem is humanity is probably one of the most important things when it comes to writing code. But we tend to leave this impression in the world that programmers are cold-hearted somehow, and we are antisocial. I have to beg to differ. I'll tell you, I'm one of the quietest people you will ever find on an airplane. When I sit on an airplane, I always sit in a window seat, and I would start coding away and writing. I don't want to waste my time talking to the person next to me, because there is so much to really think and so much to write. But the minute I find the person next to me that she is a programmer, everything changes. Now we got to talk all the way from checked exceptions to garbage collection to static typing to dynamic typing will turn into a riot. So I figured out this much for sure. Programmers are not antisocial. We're just social among the right kind of people. But we really, really care about humanity, and we should, because there's always somebody who is going to read the code behind us, after us, and we should really be uh, considering them. So humanity is absolutely something we need to focus on as well. This applies to coding. Well, this one is a pet peeve. I I'm going to say comment why and not what. We are living in an insane world today. Uh, people are forced to write comments. One of the reasons why people are writing so many comments is we have had a very broken education system. I'll say this proudly because I'm a faculty of computer science. So um, I have seen what people actually do. A good student writes code and says, look, my code is expressive. And the professor looks at it and says, where are your comments? I don't need comments, professor. I wrote readable code. I'll give you an F for this code. OK, here are my comments. And so they are forced to write comments. And then what happens? You say, well, when they go to industry, there are no professors. Good news. But there are corporate police in the uh, industry. And they tell you, you will write comments. What if I don't? No bonus for you. Here are my comments. So we are forced down to write stupid comments over and over. The other day, I saw this piece of code, and, and this was absolutely phenomenal. This developer had taken the time to say I++ with this beautiful increment next to it. <laughs> and, and when I looked at this code, I really have empathy. I understand why they do this. Because they know that Venkat is becoming old. And they know that Venkat has very poor eyesight. So this is written for Grandpa Venkat. They say, Grandpa Venkat, in case you didn't really realize, it's an increment. And so I always tell them, thank you, grandchild. This was very helpful. And, and the point really is, these are absolutely no use at all. Or something like you know x uh, and then this with this beautiful shift next to it. And the question is, like, why are we shifting? That's the whole important point, and that seems to be missing. 
So we, we need to really focus on writing code that is easier to understand. So we should not really focus on writing comments that tell us what the code is doing. So when somebody tells me I don't understand this code, write a comment, I say time out, I don't understand this code, please refactor it. So I want the code to be refactored, not comment out to tell me what the code is doing. So don't comment to cover up bad code, I want the comment to really tell me why the code exists, not what the code is doing. Now, we want to write expressive code that is self-documented. But I'll tell you the world is a crazy place because we see this over and over and over. A case in point, the, uh, so, uh, well, uh, a good code is like a good joke. This is something I've told my children, and they know this very, very well. If you ever tell a bad joke, the right response at that point is the word called never mind. Because if, if you say a bad joke and somebody says what's funny about it, the worst response is to start explaining that joke. Because that's going to be a very long evening. When you finish explaining, they look at you and say, so what's funny about it? Let me re-explain it. So you say a joke and nobody gets it. You say, never mind. And you go back to your hotel or home and you sit down quietly in silence and you refactor your joke. And then you say this to a new group of people the next day and see how it goes. So a good joke is like a, a good code is like a good joke and, and writing comments is like explaining really a bad joke. So I don't want to explain a joke. I don't want to comment a piece of code to say what the code is doing. I want to keep the comments uh, reserved for telling why the code exists. But like I said, we have, a, you know, the society we live in, we see this all the time. I was in Washington, D.C. to speak in a conference, and that morning I wanted to take a shower, which is a good thing to shower before going and giving a talk in the public. And so I got into the shower. And as soon as I got into the shower, I was so angry. And today, when you're angry, you don't take shower, you tweet about it. So I immediately jumped out of the shower, grabbed my phone, I tweeted it. But what did I see so bad? What I saw was this. I got into the shower, and it said, pull to turn on. You know, I got so angry, I was intellectually insulted. Because why can't you design a shower I could actually use than telling me pull to turn on? So the tweet I posted was the following. I said, those who cannot design are condemned to document. And, and the whole point is, why can't we design this in a way we can actually understand how to use this than telling me how to operate the shower, and there's really no reason to do this. But we see this all the time in the code, isn't it? You see, in P1, in P2, in P3 as parameters, followed by a comment that says what P1 and P2 and P3 stand for, like why? Why can't we just name this so it's easy to understand than having to write a comment for explaining that, and that's the real question. So rather than order three, where three is a magic number, why not order coffee size large so I can actually understand what this is, a purpose is, and it becomes self-documenting code, as you can see. So the point is, document code using well-chosen, meaningful names of variables. Use comments to describe its purpose and constraints. Don't comment code as a substitute for good code. I want the code to be really self-describing. That is absolutely important. Well, the next thing I want to talk about here is to avoid long methods. Now, we all have come across long methods in our lives, isn't it? So uh, how, uh, what are some of the problems of long methods? Long methods are hard to understand. Long methods are hard to debug. Long methods are hard to maintain. Long methods are hard to test. Long methods lead to duplication of code. Long methods are hard to reuse. I mean, we could keep going with all these problems with long methods. In in fact, the other day somebody said very grimly, he said, long methods tend to become longer. That is so true, isn't it? And so as a result, long methods are really, really bad. We should avoid it. I was speaking at DevOps Belgium a couple of years ago, and somebody posted this on YouTube. If you search for it, you'll find it. But I shouldn't have asked this question. DevOps Belgium, there were 800 uh, you know, seats in front. I cannot see because it's a dark room in an IMAX theater. And I shouldn't have asked this question. I asked the question, what's the longest method you have seen? And deep down from the middle of the room comes a voice. And the voice said, 40,000. And I'm like, wow, that's your entire class. He said, no, one method. And I'm like, where do you work in hell? And I finished my talk, 
And this gentleman comes over to me and says, I am the one who said 40,000. He was not kidding. I can see in his eyes, he meant the truth. I said, wow, 40,000. He said, it's actually worse than that. I said, how could it be any worse? He said, I didn't know it at the time, but I was hired full time to maintain, refactor this one function. I didn't even know such job exists, where your entire mission in life is to refactor that one method. And, and a full year went by. I was setting up my computer in exactly the same hall in Box, Belgium the next year. And this gentleman walks over to me and says, hey, Venkat, do you remember me? I said, how could I ever forget you? <laughs> and, and he said, I don't know why, but I have this brotherly love towards you. Will you listen to me? I said, I'll be your brother today and any time for that matter. Tell me, brother, how are things going? He said, well, I'm here to tell you, I worked on this code for one full year now, and I'm so proud to report to you, we are down to 30,000 lines now. <laughs> so we both agreed that we are going to meet one day when he will tell me there are zero lines in this method. Well, it's kind of scary, isn't it, when you have to deal with methods that are long like that. So long methods are really evil, but how long is really long? Well, if I tell you 1,000 lines are long, we all probably will agree in this room. What if I say 100 lines is long? Well, Java programmers are so happy, 100 lines are awesome, but Ruby programmers are like, 100 is too much. What if I say 10? The Clojure guys probably are saying it's long, the Ruby guys are happy with it. Well, the point is you cannot put two programmers in a room and agree on what a long method is. The other day somebody said, I got a better metric. And he said, if you can see the entire method in a window, it is not long. And the minute he said it, somebody said, what's your font size? There is no way to really answer this question. So the point really is that we cannot really agree on what a long method is. But here's a better way to think about what a long method is. It turns out a long method is not about the length of the method, but it's the number of levels of abstraction in a method. So you want to really ask the question, what are the levels of abstraction? And you want to really minimize the number of levels of abstraction in a piece of code. It's not about the length, but it's the level of abstraction. This is what is called the slap principle, also known as a single level of abstraction principle. And you want to really lower that. The next thing I want to talk about here is to give meaningful names for methods, names for variables, and everything else. Now, this is actually something I've started noticing quite a bit, and this has only gotten worse with Lambda expressions. Because what do people normally do these days? They write code like this. For example, they say, you know, a map, for example, and then what do they do? This is absolutely random, isn't it? A K, and then they do something. The other day I was looking at a piece of code. It had a variable called K. Then it had a variable called X. Then it had a variable called R. Then it had a variable called P. And I wanted to really find out what the next variable would be. And I was trying to do a pattern matching. I couldn't find it. But then eventually I found out how these variables are given such wonderful names. I have this theory, and I'm almost close to verifying it. The way this works is the programmer is coding and is about to type the name of the variable when something distracts them, like a phone call. In the meantime, their cat literally walks on the keyboard. And they're like, oh my goodness. And they take their little cat and say, what a beautiful variable name you gave for me. You go play now. And they just continue coding because because, I mean, how would you really feel changing the variable your cat gave to the code? Well, the point really is these variables don't help us at all. Now, what if somebody has an arbitrary p here? I mean, let's ask, let me ask you this question. Would you do this to your children? Would you name your child P, right? Uh, so, child, what's your name? A P? Is it your initial? Oh, no, that's my full name. I'll tell you, if a full name of a child is a single letter variable that only tells you both the parents are programmers. Because if one parent was a programmer, then the other one will say, are you insane? On the other end, when they are both programmers, hey, honey, what do you want to name the child? I'm thinking of P, oh, I love you so much. That's a great name, right? So the point is, this is a disservice to the entire humanity because we can understand what the code is doing. Well, the point is, a programmer is somebody who names their children really easily, but has a really hard time naming their variables. So we really want to come up with good names for variables. That's very important. A case in point, I was looking at a project I was working on. I asked for permission to take a photo, a photo of it. They were very kind to give me this. This coders on this product, programmers on this product, are very advanced specialized engineers. 
And when, what I saw was, well, not this code, the, uh, the line below this code. It said, God help me, I have no idea what this means. And somebody has left this little document in there to tell me that this is really hard to maintain. So the point really is, Variable names represent abstraction, and we should really respect that. And we should give good names for variables, good name for methods, good name for classes, and avoid single letter variable names, except in cases like maybe a, a, you know iteration, like an I index a variable, and we should be very sensitive to that. Well, uh, if you cannot name a variable appropriately, it simply means that we haven't really understood it. Uh, real quick about code reviews, I'm a huge fan of code review, but I'll tell you a few things I do differently. Uh, I don't review code, I review the test before I review the code. And in that case, of course, if the test is not good quality or if the test is not even there, I flag that first, so read the, review the test before reviewing the code. The second thing I will emphasize is when I find a bug these days, I don't report a bug, I write a test that fails because of the, of the bug and I simply check it in. And that's a really good way to communicate with, the, with team members. When a test fails, they realize there's a bug and they fix it. It also promotes uh, the behavior for other members to start writing tests when they do it. And the third thing is, when I started doing this more recently, I found that I couldn't write a test that fails, and eventually I found out that I didn't understand a piece of code. So now we start saying there's a bug, my recommendation was to refactor this code. So there are certain things I do to really make this uh, easier for us. The last thing I will mention here is reduce state and state mutation. Now if you ask me what is one thing you're doing different today, Venkat, than you did 20 years ago or 10 years ago, hands down I will say I write code with a lot fewer states these days. When I pair program with my clients these days, I will sit down to program with them and I will see them write public class and the next thing they're writing a field, I would say, why are you writing a field? And they'll kind of shrug and say, because I need it. And the answer is no, I don't want the state to be self-serving. I want the state to be brought in by a behavior. So start writing methods and only reluctantly bring in state. Well, there are a couple of reasons why we want to focus on this. We want to think more typeless and aim for minimalism fewer state and less mutability as much as we can, and, and solve real relevant parts of the pro uh, problem that we actually understand. It turns out messing with state is the root of many problems, both in software and in politics. And we see this uh, consistently all the time. And finally, of course, mutability needs company. It often hangs around with bugs. So the more mutability we have code, the harder it is to maintain the code as well. So we talked about 12 ways to make the code suck. We talked about scheduling time to lower technical debt. We talked about favoring high cohesion to uh, loosen coupling, but also to eliminate where possible, program with intention rather than accidentally or, or, or in desperation, avoid primitive obsession, uh, prefer clear code instead of clever code, apply the Zunzer principle on writing good English nonfiction to programming, Comment why the code exists, not what the code is doing. Avoid long methods, apply the single level of abstraction principle. Give good name for variables, methods, and classes. Uh, do tactical code reviews, but always review tests before reviewing code, and reduce the state and state mutation as much as you can. I'll leave a, a departing thought with you on this one. Uh, we all are always under constant time pressure, but here's something I want you to really think about a little bit. Uh, the first step in becoming a better programmer is to let go of the conviction that we can code it once and get it right on the first write. The entire game is in rewriting code, and I don't think anyone can ever write good quality code in the first sitting. Uh, and so it's about writing code and then rewriting it and refactoring it, and that's the only way we can continuously improve what we do. I, I hope that was useful. Thanks for coming.